Welcome to Securing America with me, Frank Gaffney, the program that's a kind of owner's manual for protecting the country we love against all enemies, foreign and domestic, to God's glory and that of his kingdom. I'm going to set the stage for a very important conversation I'm going to have with two dear friends, many years, about Ukraine by stating my own personal inclinations on the subject. Um, I am not only deeply sympathetic to the people of Ukraine who are suffering horribly at the hands of Vladimir Putin and his army. Uh, the aggression is unimaginably uh, awful. We haven't really seen it since World War II, on, certainly on the continent of Europe. I'm also very much of the view that Ukraine is part of the free world. And we as Americans need to stand with those who are the object of efforts to lop off parts of the free world. And unfortunately, this won't be the last one if Putin succeeds. Now, having said that, I'm going to ask my two friends, Bob McConnell and his wife, Nadia, about the case for Ukraine that they are perhaps uniquely qualified to make as co-founders and leaders of a marvelous organization, the U.S.-Ukraine Foundation. They both have extensive experience in government. Um, Bob, as an assistant attorney general, going back to our time together in the Reagan administration. Nadia, among other things, as a congressional liaison for uh, FEMA and for NASA. But they also have had on their hearts, uh, long before the present crisis, um, the cause of freedom in Ukraine and the need for the United States to stand with its people. And so I have asked them to come alongside to talk a bit about, uh, well, not only why we should care about Ukraine, but um, how to respond to some of those who think we might not need to. So. Lady and gentlemen, welcome. It's so good to have you with us. It's good to be reconnected with you after far too long. Well, Frank, thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to talk about these, I think, very critical issues that we think all of us Americans really need to understand the, the many dimensions to, to your question. Yeah, I agree. Let, let me just ask you pointedly. We're told that we don't have really an interest in Ukraine. Um, that this is, if anybody's problem, it's Europe's problem, uh, that there are so many um, difficulties with Ukraine, notably it's a corrupt place. Uh, um, uh, the president is, uh, is, you know, not the great Democrat that we are uh, led to believe. Just give us ground truth as you see it. Nadia, maybe we could start with you, uh, particularly on sort of the, uh, the, the people side of this equation. Well, Yes, and I'm so glad that you talk about the people of Ukraine instead of Ukrainian people, because I think it's important for people to appreciate that there are over 100 different ethnic uh, peoples living mm -hmm. and have been living in Ukraine. And what you're seeing here now is all of them defending their homeland, mm -hmm. uh, whether they're ethnic Ukrainians or ethnic Russians and Jewish people and all the other minorities. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that is very important for people to get that understanding. And certainly that goes against, you know, Putin's propaganda about yeah. uh, defending, you know, Russian speakers. Who wasn't a Russian speaker in the Soviet Union, right? Well, that's right, of course. Um, and Bob, to you, I guess the strategic side of that uh, equation, uh, what is the vital interest, as you see it, of uh, the United States in uh, not only this outcome of the present crisis, but more generally in Ukraine? Well, before talking about the outcome, uh, the, the strategic interest, Ukraine sits, <clears throat> criti it's critically geopolitical, where it's located, all the different things that go on there. And indeed, uh, I guess it was Brzezinski who said, Russia is a nation by itself. Mm -hmm. With Ukraine, it's an empire. It, that feeds the Kremlin's expansionist desires, and they don't stop at yeah. Ukraine. 
and, one of and, the things and those so- desires are are personified by Vladimir Putin, of course. And, and one of the things I wanted to ask you about is uh, there's a lot of talk now about a ceasefire and just you know basically freezing the situation in place. You have the Russians in uh, large swaths of the country now, both in the east and the south. Um, we're going to be speaking on a webinar tomorrow uh, that the Center for Security Policy is sponsoring with you two and. Uh, one of our senior fellows, Andrei Ilyanarov, who used to work in the Kremlin. And one of the things that he's shared, and I'm sure he will uh, tomorrow, is Putin's determination to have the hold of Ukraine, uh, most especially Kiev, for a variety of reasons. Uh, is that your assessment as well, that this is not just about, uh, to Nadia's point, freeing up, uh, liberating, as he calls it, some of these Russian-speaking or ethnic types? If I might, I, and I'm sorry, I'm going to jump in here too, because Please. I think important point uh, that needs to be, why is it in our interest, U.S. interests, beyond the security uh, issues, uh, it's the geopolitical uh, strategic place in, that Ukraine is, let's think about the things that are going to affect everyday Americans and other people around the world. Mm-hmm. And that has to do with the food supply chain. Right of what that means. Yesterday, Robert, right, there was a story about Egypt now having to secure its grain traveling all around the world because they're concerned they're not going to be able to get uh, their regular supplies from Ukraine. So we are just beginning to see the impact. So the same thing on energy. You can just go down the line and it's going to affect every one of us directly. It's not just about the geopolitical uh, you know, strategic position that Ukraine holds. No, and I think that's a really important point. Uh, and that brings me to one of the other questions, which is, of course, going back to the Europeans and all of this, um, it seems as though they are uh, with the people of Ukraine. Uh, they're sending arms and, uh, and other forms of support, of course. And yet they are not cutting off the Russians from uh, the cash flow that they provide with their purchases of energy. Maybe oil, yes, but uh, gas, not so much. Talk a little bit about that, uh, if you would, and and how that bears on this larger question of, do they perceive this the way we are being encouraged to, as important to us? Well, I mean, it's it's different in different European countries. Obviously, you know, France and, and Germany easily come to mind because of their resistance to providing arms and support and so forth. But they're, you know, they're held, Russia has a grip around their neck on energy and, and big corporations are heavily, heavily invested in Russia. Uh, so they have a very hard time extracting themselves and looking at it. Uh, you turn to the Poles and the Baltic states, Finland, Sweden, uh, the Czech Republic, uh, they're they're scared to death that if Ukraine falls, they're next. The, the notion that there's some magic line at NATO borders is, is just a silly notion. I mean, if he takes Ukraine, he's, there will be incursions uh, elsewhere and they'll put, he will go until he is stopped. Right. That's, that's such a critical point. And it's one that we're going to talk about more on the other side of a short break here, Bob. But I, I do want to just emphasize that um, this is uh, the perception, I think, not just of people in Ukraine, obviously, but uh, as you say, people on the other side of that line uh, in uh, the NATO countries, um, to the point where uh, some of them are frantically uh, now trying to get into NATO, notably the Finns and the Swedes, uh, to try to have that line be at least uh, on the other side of their their border. Um, whether it will work or not remains to be seen, but um, we're going to talk about the threat that Putin represents to the West more generally on the other side of a very short break, um, along with what we're going to be required to do to ensure that we do stop him. That and more with the McConnells right after this. <laughs> 